Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Meeple University. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Clash of Cultures the Monumental Edition. Coming up. Let's learn to play Clash of Cultures the Monumental Edition, game designed by Christian Markerson and published by WizKids. If you find value from this video later, please hit the like button. Subscribe to us, hit the bell and leave your feedback in the comments for others to find. For now, let's get to the table. Clash of Cultures is a Civilization 4X game for 2-4 players. Over 6 ages of play, players will advance their societies, expand their own cities, spread their culture to the cities of their opponents, and go out attempting to conquer. The player with the most cultural influence after six ages wins the game. Clash of Cultures Monumental Edition contains both the base Clash of Cultures game and the Civilizations expansion, both slightly updated from their original releases back in the early 2010s. In this video, we'll first take you through the base rules and then explain the differences for the expansion at the end of the video. To set up, take a player board, a player aid, and all of the various pieces in your colour. All coloured components are considered limited in the game. In the base game, you won't be using your leader, cavalry, elephants, markets, observatories, or obelisks. Put them back in the box. Each player places the resource trackers on their starting position, which is two for food, and zero for wood, stone, ideas, and gold. Then take five of your coloured cubes. One goes on farming, one goes on mining, and then three go in these slots on the event tracker. Each civilization begins the game capable of farming and mining. Separate the double-sided starting map tiles from the single-sided normal tiles, and then build the map according to your player count. Be aware that you may need to flip these starting tiles over to achieve the right symmetry. Each player now sets up a starting city on a plain space by placing a settlement, a settler, and a mood token showing that this settlement is happy. Shuffle the Wonder, Objective, Action, and Event cards, removing any which show the expansion icon here in the bottom left corner. Each player draws a starting hand of one objective and one action. Place the grey barbarian pieces the gold wonders and the battle dice nearby. Choose a first player and you're now ready to play. Clash of Cultures is played in six ages, each age being separated by a reset phase called the status phase. Each age is broken into three rounds. In each round, each player will take one turn, starting from the first player and going clockwise around the table. And on each turn, a player will take three main actions, as well as any number of free actions. As such, across the course of a full game, you will take 54 main actions. There are six different main actions available in the game. These are Advance, to gain a new advancement for your civilization. Found City, to use a settler to start a new settlement. To activate a city, where one of your cities either collects resources, constructs a new building, or recruits new units, to increase the happiness of one or more of your cities, to attempt to influence the culture of a building in an opponent's city, and finally to move units, which may result in the exploration of new lands, or the initiation of combat with an enemy. You may take the same type of main action multiple times on the same turn, but there are some restrictions on some actions, which we'll cover through the video. Through the game, players will have seven different types of resources that they'll be able to spend on their actions. Food, wood, stone, ideas, and gold are tracked at the top of your player board. You cannot have more than two food until you've built the storage advance, which we'll talk about later and you otherwise can't hold more than seven of any of these resources. Gold is a wild resource and may be spent in place of any of the other four. The other resources are culture tokens and mood tokens, which are gained in token form and have no maximum. 
And do note that these mood token components serve two functions in the game. A mood token owned by a player is a resource that can be gained and spent, while a mood token on the map is a marker indicating the happiness level of the associated city. Clash of Cultures is a civilization building game, and you'll earn your points by spreading your presence across the map, whether that be by building your own buildings and wonders, influencing the culture of your opponent's cities, or conquering your opponent's cities outright. You'll also score for each advance that you make and each objective card that you complete. And the player with the most points over six ages of play will win the game. So now let's look at each action in detail. The first action is advance, and you can use this to gain one of the 48 different advances available to your civilization. The cost is a mix of two food or ideas, which you can spend in any combination. Then move one cube from your event tracker area to the advance that you wish to make. The advances are broken into nine basic sections and three government sections. The first advance that you make in any section must be the top one. But after that, all three of the ones below it are available. You don't have to go from top to bottom. To begin a government advance, you must have the bottom item from the section directly above it available as a prerequisite. So here, for example, philosophy is the prerequisite to voting in the democracy section. You can only have advances in one government type at a time. So right now, even though having the prerequisite for nationalism, this player cannot gain one of these advances. There is a way to switch your government, but you can't do it as part of the advance action. If the advance that you gain has a yellow border, then you gain one mood token. And if it has a blue border, then you gain one culture token. You now have access to the ability of that advance, and you've gained half a point for the end of the game. We won't cover every advance in detail through this video, but there are some critical ones which we'll go through when their actions are relevant. Finally, if as a result of this action your event tracker is now empty, you will flip and resolve the top card of the event deck before refilling your event tracker with three new cubes. We'll cover the details of events later in the video. The second action is to found a new city, and this is done by one of your settlers. The settler must be on a hex which is not barren, does not already contain a city, and does not contain any enemy units. To take the action, simply remove the settler from the board and replace it with one of your settlement pieces. The third action is to increase the happiness of one or more of your cities. Cities in the game have three potential states, happy, neutral, or angry. Happy cities are substantially more productive than angry ones, and so it's good to have your cities in a happy state. This can be done by spending mood tokens from your supply. For a single increase happiness action, you may perform as many increase happiness steps as you can afford. The cost to increase a city's happiness by one step is equal to its size, which is the total number of building pieces, including the central settlement, that makes up that city. So right now, the player could spend two mood tokens to increase this city from neutral to happy, three mood tokens to increase this city from angry to neutral, and another three to increase it from neutral to happy. The fourth action is Activate City, and when you take this action, you choose one of your cities and then perform one of three sub-actions with it. These are Collect, which is to gain resources from the hexes in and around that city. Construct, which is to build a new building in that city. Or Recruit, which is to gain new units from that city. You must be wary about overworking your cities, as this will reduce the city's mood. If you activate the same city a second or third time on the same turn, then you will reduce its mood by one step for each of those additional activations. First from happy to neutral, then from neutral to angry. You can continue activating an angry city without further penalty. The first type of activation is Collect, which allows you to collect resources from surrounding hexes. The most resources a neutral city can collect is equal to its size. 
This number is increased by one for a happy city and reduced to one for an angry city. A city has access to its hex and all of the visible hexes around it, and each type of hex produces a different resource. Plains produce food, forests produce wood, and mountains produce stone. Each hex can only produce once per activation, so activating this city here the player could gain a total of three resources, but only a maximum of two stone and a maximum of one wood. Sea and barren hexes do not produce unless the player has the relevant advance. A player with irrigation can produce food from barren hexes, and a player with fishing can produce food from sea. When you construct, you will build one of the four types of buildings shown here on your player aid into the city you've activated. Each building has the same cost, one food, one stone, and one wood. Then add the matching building piece into the city. This will be worth one point if you still control it at the end of the game, and increases the size of the city by one. There are a number of restrictions on this action. You cannot construct in an angry city. You may only construct a building if you have the prerequisite advance already in your civilization, which is listed here next to the building. Each of these is the top advance of the thematically relevant section of advances. For example, the port requires fishing, the academy requires writing, the fortress requires tactics, and the temple requires myths. A city cannot have more than one of the same type of building. And a building cannot be constructed if the size of the resulting city is higher than the total number of cities that that player owns on the map. This player would need to have placed a third settlement at least before being able to place a second building into this city. This applies only when taking the construction action, and players may have cities larger than their number of cities later in the game once players get conquering. Finally, the maximum size for any city is 5. Ports may only be built in cities which are adjacent to sea hexes, and multiple ports may adjoin the same sea hex. Then, if the constructed building has an immediate effect, resolve that now. Otherwise, you'll get to use that building's effect later in the game. As part of a construct activation, players may also be able to construct a wonder. These are high cost, but powerful and high scoring cards. This is only open to players who have the engineering advance and have at least one wonder card in hand, which can come from engineering or monuments. It may also only be done by activating a happy city, not neutral. Spend the cost printed on the card, rather than the one wood, one stone, one food of other buildings. Have the prerequisite advance already completed. Then add the matching gold coloured wonder piece to the city, and then place the wonder card face up on the table. Its ability is now available to you. The third way to activate a city is to recruit units to it, such as soldiers or settlers. For a neutral city activation, you can recruit up to as many units as the city's size. For a happy city, you can recruit one more. And for an angry city, you can recruit a maximum of one. The types of unit you can recruit are shown here, settlers, infantry, and ships, and their costs are shown here. Settlers can be used to found new cities and create trade routes. Infantry can be used to spread your presence and wage land battles. And ships can be used for more rapid sea travel and naval battles. When recruiting, land units are placed in the same hex as the city that recruited them and ships are placed in the adjacent sea hex where the port is pointing. Ships may only be built in cities with a port. If you've run out of the unit you're recruiting, you can move it from elsewhere on the board. Through these rules, I will sometimes refer to infantry by that name, and sometimes I'll refer to army units as a whole. In the base game, these terms are one and the same. Infantry is the only type of army unit, but once you introduce the expansion, these three types of units also count as army units. This will be important when interpreting these rules for the expansion portion at the end of the video. When taking actions, whether it be recruit or any other action, you may never have more than four of the same player's army units in one hex. But this limit does not apply to settlers or ships. 
The fifth action is to attempt to influence the culture of an opposing player's city. Conquering another player's city outright is not the only way to spread your civilization's culture. If you do have a strong culture, you can influence the way that the other cities construct and operate their buildings. This will be worth points to the influencer at the end of the game. To take this action, choose one of your own cities. Its mood does not matter, and because this is not part of the activate city action, you take no mood penalty for doing this on the same turn as an activation. Then choose another player's city that has at least one building that is within your city's range, which is equal to its size. Range can be counted across land and sea hexes, but not across unexplored ones, so this city could only try to influence this one. You may also increase your range by spending culture tokens, one step per token. So here by spending one token, range could be increased to cover this city, but not this one, which is still four steps away across revealed hexes. Once you've chosen your target, roll a die, trying to score a five or above. This die is a 12-sided d6. If after the roll you've failed to reach 5, you can choose to spend culture tokens to boost this up to 5. Here it would take 2 tokens to turn the 3 to a 5 and score a success. If successful, then replace one of the buildings in the city that you targeted with the same building in your own colour. You may only target buildings, not the central settlement or a wonder. For the purposes of the game, the player that owns the central settlement still owns this city and still owns this building. Blue has the full benefits that this building offers. And by the same token, red does not get the benefits of this building. However, at the end of the game, it is red who will score one point for this building rather than blue. You can only influence the culture of a building which is owned by the city's owner. Here, if red was successful against this blue city, the only option is to influence this fortress, because the port is already influenced by a third player. A city which has at least one building of another player's colour in it cannot be used to target another player's city for cultural influence. Its culture is not strong enough. However, such a city can be used to try to influence its own culture back in the normal way by rolling a die and trying to roll a 5 or 6. When targeting your own city with this action, you are not allowed to boost the roll with culture tokens. But if your roll is successful, then you get to swap one of your buildings back out with a building of your own colour. Each player may only take one successful influence culture action per turn, but may have several unsuccessful attempts leading to the successful one. The last main action is to move, and this is how you move your recruited units around the board. Moving can trigger two sub-actions. Firstly, Exploration, which occurs when you enter an unexplored tile, and Combat, which is initiated when army units enter a hex with an enemy city or an enemy unit. When you take a movement action, you gain three movement points. Each movement point may be used to move a single unit or move a group of units, such that they start and end on the same hex. For land units, each movement point lets you move to an adjacent hex, and by C, the movement point lets you move the unit or group to any other C hex in the same contiguous C region. There are several restrictions on movement. The same unit cannot be moved as part of different movement points on the same action whether that be by itself or as a group. But you can move a unit twice on your turn, as long as you spend a separate move action for its second movement point. This too comes with some restrictions. A unit which has entered a mountain on one action cannot be moved again on this turn. You must wait till the next round and that player's next turn. A unit which has entered a forest can move again on this turn, but not in a way which initiates combat. That move would not be allowed on a subsequent action, but this one would be. And a unit cannot move again after being involved in combat. So these two could move and win a combat here, but would not be able to move again until the player's next turn. 
Settlers may never take a move which would initiate combat unless accompanied by an army unit. And army units can never be moved at all until you have the tactics advance. The player's ships can be used to carry land units around the board, or maybe even just serve as a bridge over the sea. Each ship has the capacity to carry two land units. In this instance, the player could spend a movement point to move four of these land units onto these two ships, and another movement point as part of the same action to move these ships. Moving a ship which contains units that have moved does not count as moving those units again. Another movement point could then be spent to disembark these units onto an adjacent land space. Disembarking does count as moving these units, and so this would have to wait until a subsequent movement action. A player with the navigation advance can treat the nearest sea region, either clockwise or anti-clockwise around the edge of the board, as being contiguous with their own. So here, for a red ship with navigation, this sea is on the edge of the board, and so this ship could go outside the board to this hex, or in the other direction all the way around to this hex. However, such movement is blocked by unexplored tiles, and so this ship could either go around here, as before, or could stop here and explore. Either way, this hex is not reachable with one movement point. Ships with navigation give a player the greatest range to move quickly across the board, possibly coming in behind enemy lines to attack cities from behind. When any unit enters an unexplored tile, you will flip it over and explore it, placing it into one of its two orientations. When exploring by land, you will have chosen a destination hex for your units to land on. Then flip the tile. If there's only one orientation that works because of the location of the sea, then you'll place the tile in that orientation. If both orientations give a valid land destination, then orient in the way which makes an existing sea area larger. If you can't make a sea area larger, then place any sea piece on the edge of the map. And if there's still no clear orientation, then you get to choose which way you place the tile. You'll now follow all the normal rules restricting movement, so this settler wouldn't be able to move again this turn, having moved into and explored the mountains. When exploring by sea, you choose a destination tile rather than a destination hex, and then flip the tile over and place it so that you can reach any sea on that area from your original location. If the tile drawn has no sea, or you otherwise can't get to the sea, then reveal the tile, but do not move your ship. In Clash of Cultures, a combat is initiated any time a unit enters a hex with an enemy unit or an enemy city. The exception to this is a ship entering a hex which is overhung by a city's port. This does not initiate combat. There are a few other ways to initiate combat, such as recruiting a ship to a hex that contains an enemy ship. A combat is always resolved immediately prior to moving on to the next movement point. Some combats, such as an army advancing on an undefended city or on a settler, have an automatic outcome. But for all other cases, you will go through the combat process. A combat is resolved in combat rounds, and each combat round has five phases. Playing action cards, revealing action cards, rolling dice, removing casualties, and checking the end of the battle. At the end of a combat round, if neither player has lost or retreated, then you'll play another full combat round. The first phase, playing an action card, may only be done by a player who has the tactics advance. First the attacker, then the defender, may choose one action card from hand and play it face down on the table. Then each player reveals any chosen action card. For the purposes of combat, you'll be referring to the bottom half of this card. The effect will only be valid if you have at least one of the unit types in the battle, as shown here in brackets, and is valid for the phase and condition as shown in the text. Next, each player rolls one combat die per army unit they have in the battle. Here red has four infantry and will roll four dice, while blue has two infantry for two dice, and a settler who does not engage in the combat. 
In this instance, Blue's action card adds an additional combat die in defense. These dice are now rolled. Your basic combat roll will be to add up all of the numbers showing on the dice. So here red has 15 and blue has 11. Additionally, for each symbol which matches one of the units in the battle, you can resolve the clash effect for that unit type. This here is the clash symbol for infantry. And per your player aid, the clash ability for infantry is to add one to the combat roll. Adding this clash effect to the total roll gives 16. Likewise, on the defensive side, this clash effect would normally increase this roll of 11 to 12, but in this instance, the tactic card played cancels any defensive clash effects. Each die and unit may only be used once for a clash effect, so in this instance here, this matching clash roll would not trigger a clash effect. You'll also see that many of these symbols on these dice are associated with the expansion units. In this instance, the combat rolls are 16 to 11, and now it's time to assign casualties. Each side scores one hit per five on the combat roll. So a roll of 16 is three hits, and a roll of 11 is two hits. The player suffering the hits removes one army unit per hit. So red would remove two infantry, and blue would remove two infantry without having one to take the third hit. Settlers can't absorb hits, but if a settler is ever alone with enemy army, then the settler is lost as well. After assigning hits, it's time for the end of battle phase, and here you'll determine whether there is a winner or a loser, and if the battle continues. If only one player has army units left, then that player wins and the other loses, and the battle is over. If both players lose all of their units, then the combat is over and neither player wins nor loses. This definition can be important. Some objectives refer to winning a combat. If neither player has run out of units, then the attacker has the option to retreat, returning those army units to the place they came from. In this case, the battle again ends with neither a winner nor a loser. In all other cases, you'll commence a new round of combat. Discard any action cards that were played in the previous round. One important type of building in a combat is the fortress, which provides some extra defense on the first round of a combat where it occurs. The fortress adds one combat die for the defender and cancels one of the attacker's hits, making a fortified city well placed to withstand attack. And a fortress always allows for at least one defensive roll, even if there are no units in the city. However, its power stops working after the first combat round of any combat. And so in this instance here, Blue is the only one with units remaining, and Blue has won this combat. Sending an army unit to an unfortified enemy city, or to a hex containing only enemy settlers, counts as combat, and as an instant victory for the attacker. If you have army units in an undefended enemy city after a battle is complete, then you capture the city. Replace all of those city's pieces in the enemy colour with your own pieces, including the central settlement, which tells players that you are the city's owner. If you've run out of the building type because all of your other ones are on the board, then simply destroy the building and gain a gold. If the city contained another player's culturally influenced building, then you don't get to replace that, and if it contained a wonder, then the card is given to the city's new owner, but marked with the city's old owner's cube. The new owner gets the ability of the power, but the players will split the four points. Two to the player who built it, and two to the player who owns it at the end of the game. The new owner now plunders the city and gains gold based on its size and happiness. The gold will be equal to the city's size for a neutral city, equal to size plus one for a happy city, and equal to exactly one for an angry city. Then, whatever its mood before the attack, make the city angry. Finally, the player who lost the city gains a free settler in another city. The settler has been forced out of his former home. Land units are not involved in a naval battle, even if they're being carried by those ships. 
If a ship is destroyed, then the ship's owner may have to also lose units in order to make sure that the group of units being carried does not exceed the capacity of the remaining ships. Those are the six basic main actions that you can take, but there are a few other actions available in the game. Some of these will come on the action cards and represent the top half of that card. A card like this is played to bolster one of your other main actions. A card that says as an action is played as one of your three main actions for the round. And a card that says free action can be played in addition to your three actions for the round. The same types of effects may be triggered from some of your advances, such as free actions or as an action effects. Some even allow you to take some of the major actions that we've spoken about before as a free action. Here for example you'd pay a mood token to get a collect action in addition to your other three actions for the round. Players can also freely trade among each other as a free action, exchanging resources including mood tokens and culture tokens, as well as objective, wonder and action cards and promises for current or future actions. Any future promises made are not binding unless your group wants to make them binding. Although it's not associated with an action, I will also quickly describe the Trade Routes Advance, which is a way of using your settlers and ships to gain extra food. A Trade Route exists when one of your settlers or ships is within a distance of two from another player's non-angry city. Each unit and city can only be a part of one Trade Route at a time, and so here this ship could be in a Trade Route with any one of these three cities while these settlers are only within range of this one. This city is angry and can't be part of any trade route. In this instance, red can make two trade routes, one and two. In addition to the trade routes advance, this may help you in some of the objectives or action cards in the game. After the third round of an age is complete, you'll move on to the next status phase. Firstly, each player may complete any number of status phase objectives by playing objective cards face up from their hand. Each completed objective is worth two points and players may choose to complete either the civilization based green half or the military based red half. Do note there are some objectives which are scored immediately when completed. This phase is only for the ones which say status phase in the text. Next, each player gets to make a no cost advancement following all of the normal rules from the advance main action. This includes resolving an event if the event tracker is empty. Next, each player gets to draw one new objective and one new action card. Then each player may raise one of their size one cities to the ground, removing it from the board and gaining one gold. And this can be useful to get low value cities off the board and give you some pieces back. Next, you may choose to change your system of government. Pay a mood and a culture and then move all of your government cubes from your current government to your new government. You must have the prerequisite advance for the new government and you can rearrange the cubes however you'd like as long as you still have the top advance. Finally, whoever has the combined most mood and culture tokens, or in the case of the tie, whoever is nearest to the left of the player who currently has the first player, gets to choose who has the first player in the next age. You'll now proceed to round one of the next age. After every third advance that each player makes, the player will draw and resolve an event card. You'll first resolve the icon in the top left corner, and then you'll resolve the text effect on the card. Some of these affect all players, and some affect only the player who drew them. For the absence of doubt, the card is written in second person, so if it refers to you, it applies only to the player who drew it, and if it says all players, then it applies more broadly. We won't take you through the text effects, but we'll take you through these icons. This one allows you to gain two gold. This one exhausts one of your land hexes. You must place an exhausted land token into an empty, non-barren land hex somewhere on the map adjacent to one of your cities. Exhausted land has effectively the same restrictions on it as barren land for most purposes in the game. The exception is when collecting with irrigation. Even that doesn't allow you to get food from exhausted land. 
The other icons are these two, Barbarians Spawn and Barbarians Move, and this introduces the grey Barbarian pieces, a common enemy to all players. When Barbarians Spawn, you must place a Barbarian Settlement and a Barbarian Infantry onto an empty, non-barren land space, which is two hexes away from one of your cities, and at least two hexes away from all other cities. If no such hexes exist, then it should go in a space adjacent to one of your cities, but still at least two hexes away from all other players' cities. And if there are still no valid spaces, no barbarians spawn. Then add another barbarian infantry to any one barbarian city on the map, which can include the one you just placed. When barbarians move, first check to see if there are any barbarian infantry within two steps of one of your cities. If there aren't, then you'll resolve the first part of a barbarian spawn effect instead of the rest of the barbarian move effect. But if there is, then you'll move all barbarians on the map one space towards your nearest city. Groups of barbarians always move together. Then add a new barbarian infantry to each barbarian city within two land hexes of one of your cities. Barbarian units can attack or be attacked in exactly the same way as player units. Combat with barbarians is resolved the same way as player combat, with the exception that barbarians cannot play tactics cards and may never choose to retreat. If barbarians capture a player's city, then you'll replace only the central settlement piece, as well as adding the new angry marker. Buildings are left in player colour and are treated as if they've been culturally influenced. When barbarians are attacked in a fortified city, they are allowed to use that fortress. When you defeat any number of barbarian units in combat, you always gain one gold. And the plunder reward for capturing a barbarian city is also always one gold. The total action we just saw would have been worth two gold. Even though you rid this city of the barbarians, the city is still angry. The game ends after the resolve objective step of the sixth ages status phase. It can also end early at the start of a status phase if all of one player's cities have been wiped off the map. Now count up final points. Each player gains one point for each settlement and building of their colour anywhere on the map, even if it's currently owned by another player or barbarian. Next, gain half a point for each advance that you've completed, without rounding it off. Gain two points for each objective card you've completed. Gain four points for each wonder that you built and still own. Gain two points for each wonder you've conquered, or each of your wonders that has been conquered. And gain any points which come from some event cards that give you points. The player with the highest score wins, and in the event of a tie, Break the tie by looking first at points from the main board, then points from advancements, then points from objectives, then points from wonders. If still tied, victory is shared. To set up for the Civilizations expansion, flip the player aid over to the red side. Each player takes one of the 15 Civilization tiles and then finds the three leader cards associated with that Civilization. Those are held in hand with the other cards. If your civilization has this icon, then it has a special starting tile associated with it. Place it so that the white bordered hex is on the inner side. Add the expansion player pieces to your collection, as well as the expansion barbarian pieces and pirates. Finally, shuffle in the expansion events and objectives. Each civilization comes with four unique advancements, and you don't get these the same way as the base game advancements. Instead, each has a prerequisite advancement, and as soon as you gain the advancement listed, you automatically gain the advancement on your Civilization card. You do not have to gain the top of your Civilization's advancements before the rest, and when you gain the Civilization advancement, the cube comes from your supply, not your event tracker. The expansion's three new buildings work exactly the same way as the base buildings, each also having a prerequisite from the top row of one of the advancement slots. And there are now three new types of land army unit, cavalry, elephants, and your leader. 
each of which is recruited with the recruit activation as normal. Elephants and cavalry can only be recruited into a city which has a market, and their main difference from infantry is a different cost and a more powerful clash ability. When you recruit your leader, you take one of your three leader cards from your hand and play it face up onto the table. This gives you one or more new abilities which, unless otherwise stated, impact the city in which the leader is standing or the battle in which the leader is fighting. You have only one leader piece and you can only have one leader at a time, but if you wish to use a recruit action while you have a leader active, you can discard the leader that's active removing it from the game entirely, and play a new one from your hand. You'll also move the leader piece to the city that you're activating. If you kill another player's leader in battle, then you take that player's leader card and add it to your scoring pile. This will be worth two points at the end of the game. As such, while leaders can be powerful, you'll also want to be careful to use them defensively or risk giving your opponents points. The Barbarians now also have access to Elephants and Cavalry. There's no specific action to bring these out. Rather, when you're adding Barbarian Army to the board, the first one added to any Barbarian City must be Infantry, and then each subsequent one may be any type of Army unit. The player who is resolving the event that put it there gets to choose, and so you can put the more difficult units there if that Barbarian Army is a greater threat to your opponent's cities. Finally, there is one new event icon, the flag, which represents the pirates. There are a total of four pirate ships in the game. To resolve the action, remove enough pirate ships from the board so that you have two to place, and then place two into sea spaces which do not contain any player ships. At least one of them must be placed adjacent to one of your cities if possible. Then each player who has at least one city adjacent to pirates must lose one resource, which can include anything on the top of your board, or a mood or culture icon. If you can't pay, one of those adjacent cities loses one mood. You cannot collect from, nor have a trade route through, a sea space which either contains pirates or is adjacent to pirates. And if you move one or more of your ships into a sea hex containing pirates, you must fight them. Win, lose, or draw, you gain one gold and your choice of either a mood or a culture for each pirate you defeat in the battle. And that's how to play Clash of Cultures, the Monumental Edition. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed this video, please help us by hitting that like button. Subscribe to us, you can also hit the meeple in the corner to do so, and hit the bell icon so you'll be one of the first to know when we have new and exciting videos. You can also follow me on Instagram for my board games journey. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please leave them in the comment section below. See you next time!